His might be a name you have not often heard or read about, but this is about to change for good. As soon as you will learn about him, you will be longing to meet him, especially if you are a young designer with great ambitions for your Nasset brand. Stefano Martinetto is the visionary CEO of Tomorrow Group, a company that after being known for some time as a showroom for brands, for fashion brands, with an eye for distributing the new next big thing in streetwear, has now expanded into a full-fledged consultant, investor, incubator, and accelerator. Martinetto believes in offering a 360 degree service to entrepreneurial creatives, as he likes to call them, to help grow their idea into businesses for the next generation. Part investors and part mentors, Tomorrow Group are growing a new breed of talent into the next generation of international and successful brands. Stefano Martinetto is a humble and quiet talent scouter and a successful businessman at the same time. He is leaving evidence that a flexible and ever-evolving business model can benefit others and oneself alike. I'm assuming his phone is buzzing with text messages from willing and hopeful young designers all over the world. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome Stefano Martinetto to Show Studio Showbiz. Stefano Martinetto, welcome to Show Studio and thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Mima, for having me. For making the time. Thank you. So, I really would like to start from the very beginning. Uh, I hear that your, fam your father was in the fashion business and uh, that you had some summer jobs. <laughs> well, um, family was in business for more than 100 years. I recently discovered, funny enough, uh, my father is working on a passion project, on a biography, on a book about uh, our family and the tailoring and fashion. It looks so like were uh, they a brand? Was it a brand? No, it was tailoring business and, uh, and a fabric trade. And oh. apparently it dates back to 1869 or something like that. But um, of course, for what is my relationship with, with, with this business, I, I started in my family, my father business, um, which I'm very proud of, by the way, because it's, it's, it's legacy, it's education, it's a family story, which I love. Um, my father was one of the first... Um, sales agent, showroom agent. He established his showroom uh, in Italy in 1971, I guess. And he was, you know, working with the upcoming designers of the era. Uh, the names were Valentino, Saint Laurent, Christian Dior. So and amazing. Fendi. These were the upcoming designers. <laughs> well, they were the upcoming designers. Yeah. And, and Enrico Coveri and uh, a number of, of brand names which I learned to, uh, to recognize and love since I was a teenager. And uh, yeah, my, my uh, humble beginnings in fashion were in fact uh, my summer job. So, so you met them? You met the designers? I, I, I met them, I serviced them. I, I, I was, they were very kind with me when I was a kid. And uh, um, my, my, my title was head of sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially, so you were my, feeding them. my summer job was, uh, I had a, I had a mag magic touch for it, it was cutting sandwiches uh, for them and lunch break. And uh, they, I remember very clearly, they had uh, a passion for my tuna sandwiches. What so I, they like who? Well, Which in one? this case, it's Mr. Valentino and Mr. Giammetti, which, which were the most entertaining characters and uh, uh, the more interesting, if I may. Um, guys to stick around. And I was, you know, 14, 15, and they were asking me for the coffees, they were asking me for the teas, and then I, I developed this, uh, this uh, ability to, to, to create these sandwiches. And did you, at the same time, develop a passion for the trade or for fashion? I was or? always very fascinated by my, my father life. Uh, it was traveling a lot, it was very elegant. Back then, fashion was, uh, was you know, all about the tailoring, the thing to do. I remember him traveling for weeks, him going to Paris. I remember carrying his very heavy yet elegant Louis Vuitton bag. God knows what else was in that bag. It was so heavy and painful on my leg all the time. And, uh, and I remember the thrill when he was coming back. So I'm packing his, uh, his luggage and him talking to me about what he was doing. And uh, so I develop a a passion through him and I develop a passion by listening. You know, you're there in the showroom, you are, uh, I, I upgraded from sandwich master to fitting model because I was size 48. So all of a sudden I was- I didn't know that. I was in between these feet. 
Yeah, well, some less exciting stuff like uh, you know double checking all the invoices and the, and, the, and shipping documents. But I was like 16, 17. I had the right shape and form, so I got like literally Mr. Giametti, Mr. Valentino pinning the jacket on me. Uh, it was the era of Gruppo Finanziario Tessile, GFT. GFT. So, yes. so it was the first fashion group. But they were licensing, not owning uh, brands such as Valentino and Armani plus others like Ungaro and Saloran. So there were, there were factories, there were the version of the Fiat yeah. in Turin. There were, yeah. In Turin you had Fiat for automotive and, and GFT for the apparel. So I ended up staying like hours, shivering with these two gentlemen, kind of fighting and arguing a little bit about so the Fiat. So was doing the fittings as well? Well, when there was, a, when there was an internal presentation, it was a, a catwalk, a proper catwalk. And it was uh, the menswear business of Valentino was very important uh, uh, back then. Well, it is now, but it was a tailoring business uh, uh, back then. So the final touch of Mr. Valentino came and go, but Mr. Giametti was pretty present there. Oh, wow, talk about hands-on. Oh my God, hands-on, abs absolutely. And, and they were uh, sometimes arguing about the feet, about the shoulder, about, you know, it was a drop seven, I was the waist. It was, so you learned the trade there. I was listening a lot. But I then you didn't, a lot. you didn't take over your father's company. I, I work with my father's company, uh, with this, uh, the name was Alex uh, Distribuzione, a very Italian company. Uh, I kind of contributed to the change it because at some point uh, I was 22, I fell in love with a number of designers which my father not necessarily uh, uh, w w had the time to take care of. And back then, the upcoming designers, we're talking about the, the 90s, Helmut Lang, Dirk Bickenberg, Walter wow. von Berendonck. So you can figure out the kid feeling empowered, uh, you know, contributing to the family business with ideas and vision, and all of a sudden dropping the tailoring pieces for skinny jeans, painters, uh, you know, vintage uh, outerwear military jackets, and, and, and uh, to my father and my father and mother uh, surprise, uh, having a blue crest in my WNLT moments with Walter von Beredok, so I got into... I kind of adapt myself. W L. Wild and little trash. Oh, sorry. That was Walter von Berendonck, uh, old Rages collection, back then. Okay. So there was a. Um, I was working for them. I was again fitting model in a sense that there was no yeah. money, so I was yeah. doing everything, yeah. <laughs> and I was going to Vienna to Mr. Lang studio before I moved to New York, and I. Um, my job there was, uh, I was an agent, of course, but I was the only guy with a decent English, so I was coordinating the sales team in Italy, which, you know, back then it was a fourth of the luxury market in the world. It was a big thing. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. 23 and 24 yeah. or something like that. It's a good, it's a good enter, entrance into the as, business. As lucky as you can be, to be honest. And before, yeah. yeah, but before going and talking about your actual company tomorrow, um, I would like to mention something I heard you said several times, and it's the word entrepreneurial creativity. So before then explaining exactly what tomorrow does to creativity, what tomorrow do to young designers, what's entrepreneurial creativity? Well, well by, by, you know, I've been doing this job in some shape or form in the last 27 years. It's not exactly. Yesterday. yesterday. Yeah, it's not exactly yesterday. I'm 45 and I started pretty young. Um, I learned there are two ways to see creativity. There's creativity per se, the genius, the artist, uh, who can adapt his creativity to um, brands, contests uh, uh, in a different way. And then there is what I, I personally fell in love with, is entrepreneurial creativity. Entrepreneur, entrepreneurial creativity means the ability of creating something which is also a business, which becomes a job, who becomes a company, who hire people, and creates a sustainable um, a businesses. A sustainable business which gives back to the community you're relating to. I love the idea that entrepreneurial creativity creates jobs, not only that creates products. And that's the main difference by, between supporting someone who has his own vision for his own brand and supporting someone who wants to become the chief creative director of Chanel, for example. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a different and approach to those things. Okay, I, I, I hear it, and it's music for my ears, because usually I say, if you don't see it in the street, it's not really relevant. It's art. So, you know, you have to decide. But then many people say that, that 
business or listening too much to the business can kill I, creative creativity. What, where do you stand there? Well, I, I stand. Uh, I stand in between. Probably. I, um, you know, we are on a mission. No, we mm -hmm. foster and champion entrepreneurial creativity. To do that, we have to help them creating a sustainable business. To create a sustainable business, you have to create a platform and help them to achieve their goals and help them to grow. Um, you can be successful as long as the person you are dealing with is not only uh, strong-minded uh, with a solid point of view, but understands the mechanism of the business. And if he understands or she understands the mechanism of the business, the creativity process is as freedom because the contest is pre-arranged, pre-organized in his mind or her mind. And uh, uh, mm. there wouldn't be any, anything more stupid from us than uh, trying to corner creativity, uh, creativity somewhere so it doesn't spring his wings. Um, essentially, is, is uh, the new art director, the new creative director, which is an entrepreneur, also is someone who understands deeply the consequence of his actions. Doesn't create per se. That's it's a new generation, true. which I recognize in, a, in many uh, extremely talented. You mentioned them, we're going to get there soon. No, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> when you're choosing one. Yeah. No, it's not that I don't want you to mention them, no, but no, I course, would yeah. like to um, stay on this for a second. Uh, do you think these people need a creative entrepreneur? So, you know, they, they have to be entrepreneurial in their creativity, but I believe that good businesses and people that I interview that I re usually respect the most are those that admit that even business has something creative. Oh my God, I mean, I, I don't believe I, I, any business today can, can shy away from creativity. It's just, it's everywhere. Um, uh, can we be, or can I be the best in my job, or can we be the best platform ever? If we were in deeply in love with creativity, absolutely not. You cannot just, it's not, there's nothing mechanics. It's yeah. about uh, that moment, the inception of an idea, the energy around things, um, the energy of like mind people seeing the same vision at the same time. Um, the entrepreneurs of today, but also the managers of today, have to fall in love to creativity. It has to be true because it's not true, you sm smell it. But do they have to be creative themselves? They have in to. In decision making? They the have to be cre creative. They have to be very fast. Uh, they have, be, they mm. have to be able to change their mind. They have flexible. to let stuff go. They have to be flexible. And they have to uh, understand and read the codes of creativity. Probably that's the really important factor. Creativity is the dominating force of economy in this era. Um, it's not and now we do something creative. No, everything is creative, yeah. <laughs> isn't it, yeah? Everything is creativity. I mean, uh, what was 20 years ago, the food and beverage industry, such a strong creative industry, probably not as much as today. What uh, changed? Well, it changed that the chef became the creative director. Uh, that experience, experiment, experiment uh, are, are more than acceptable, are, actually are in strong demand. Uh, Failure is accepted. That's probably the reason why the, the, the business is changing. The businesses are changing, and the business mind, minds are adapting. Crea failure is totally acceptable. So what, yeah, I agree. But so what's the role of the CEO in when the chef wow. or you yeah. know the designer is the creative director and has a, to be to be a helping uh, building a sustainable business? What's the role of the fair, CEO? That's Sorry. a very good. Well, question me maybe because I'm asking myself and I'm every day to, every day and I try so I, I think you have two components the first one is uh, you have to lead an organization a group of people a crew of people as we define them uh, and tomorrow with purpose and a vision and you have to bring them along your journey because you really believe and you're not making up a story you're not you know, come out with a sentence of the week. It's just like you believe what you're doing. Yeah, it's real. It, it's, yeah. It's, it's real, because it's, if it's not real, you, you can feel it. Uh, so first and foremost, you create that vision, you share it, you, you take the people with you. Then you realize that uh, uh, creativity needs a platform to achieve its goals. So you have to fill that platform with services which are really useful. 
So from hard, solid business planning to, you know, making the product, day to, day to advising, to day-to-day -day logistics, uh, uh, to sell, selling stuff, because in reality, you know, in the end, we have to have a consumer, a community who's interested in what we're doing, uh, to legal, to HR, to all these things which are so relevant and important, have to be there, like electricity needs to be in a building. So it's not even something extraordinary, it's the minimum. It's essential. It's, it's, it's the base, the base to start with. And then you gotta be able to recognize those entrepreneurs and give them the ability to, to develop themselves. And one thing you have to be able and to do, which I learned on my skin, which mm -hmm. I failed to do that in the past, just get it, get out of the way. If they are very good in doing what they're doing, you solve, they kind them. of solve the problems they don't know they will have, and just let them do their things. Why would you invest in someone or support someone or work with someone if you feel that you have to babysit them? Don't do it. You don't need them if you, you don't, have to do their work. You don't need them or probably you're thinking about yourself as an omnipresent uh, and knowledgeable person, which is probably a mistake. So just get out of the ways. I love, I love to hear this and it reminds me of one thing that one of my past bosses told me once and I guess it's what you mean. Um, freedom within a framework, when you well, said, you it know... It must be Marco with that, I guess. No, <laughs> it was never my boss, it was my colleague. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, of course. Uh, but it was yeah. Mr. Poulet, he was calling it freedom within a framework and he was talking about the designer and saying, just be yourself, be free and create, but within this yeah. framework, that it's our group. It's creating with purpose, in, my, in our definition. Creating with purpose, yes. Creating with purpose, you, you said it uh, correctly. Um, you can decide to be an artist, uh, and you can be an artist and create for the sake of creation, and mm. waiting 80, 90 years to be recognized in the world, and it's absolutely... Once you're dead. <laughs> well, not, a, not anymore, luckily for them, but I mean, in, in past history, of course. Or you want to create uh, product, uh, design, uh, wearable thing, and you want your exactly. community to, 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 to engage with it. So it has to sell. Maybe it, can, it doesn't need to sell a lot. There are zillions of ways to define what success means. You can sell 10 pieces and then release them after a year. You can sell 100,000 units of the same good, but you have to think about it and create what the purpose of what you want to do. And if you decide, you creative mind design, you are in the business of, of the fashion industry, you want to create a, uh, a product which sells and retails, is manufactured, is shipped, is distributed, is purchased, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then you're creating a company, you're creating a business, and then you have people to take care of. So it's, 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 it's a cycle. There's a purpose in everything. I like, uh, again, we, we employ well and over 150 people today, which is not, of course, large in the broader fashion contest. It's still a medium company. It's, it's a, a medium small, company. So it's that big enough to be nervous about it and small enough to know most of them. So you, okay. it's, it's a tricky situation. But I mean, I love when I meet these guys and girls and they're employed the first five or six or seven or 12 or 18. I find it amazing. Yeah. They are employing people. It's great. Fantastic. Yeah. So that brings me to tomorrow your company. Uh, so tomorrow it's been known for a few years as a show, a distribution center, yeah. whatever we want to call it, and please correct me if I'm using the wrong words, but then now, and that's one of the things that attracted me to talk to you, has become like a, yeah, an incubator as you call it, and an accelerator of business, but for me it's like a a talent scouting company, and so I'm interested in hearing, maybe you can explain to us a little bit better than I'm doing what it is exactly, but also I'm interested in understanding the difference between what we know, like the big conglomerates, the big groups that own companies, mm -hmm. and tomorrow. Well, thanks for the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there's. Of course, Tomorrow, tomorrow um, was born by the merger of my previous company and, uh, and a part of the Saturday Group, which was a media marketing uh, uh, company. And it started, as you say, as a showroom operation, so traditional agency business model plus distribution, which and was... And you were employed there? 
No, no, I was, I was, I, I wasn't employed. I was always an entrepreneur. It was my own company, and we. Okay, and we, sorry. And we. I thought you uh, did a management were, buyout. Um, no, no, no. We did a merger with them in 2010, and we did a management buyout in 2015. Okay. So we were used to own 50% of the company. Now we own the 70% of the company. Okay. I'm sorry, it's a bit geeky financial, but no, 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 let, no let, it's clear. Yeah. Um, it was a showroom, it was a distribution company, which is already a kind of innovation because showrooms don't do distribution, don't do the artworks normally. So the showroom was a, a, a wonderful gallery space in, in Paris where we were curating and selecting a number of designers. Uh, back then, our love for fashion was more focused on the British wave of women's wear designers. There were incredible talents such as Jonathan Sanders, Richard Nicole, or, or uh, Roxanda, for example. And, um, and we developed a business with uh, 10, 15 of these designers, and we recognized they needed more than selling to B2B, more than selling to Selfridges or, or Colette or the overseas market. They needed to move the goods, to invoice the goods, to, to be paid, and all this like back office because stuff. Because showroom don't do that. Normally, well, the typical, uh, of, uh, typ my father's business was representing yeah. brands and you know, charging a commission on the sales. That was, uh, okay. that was it. it was that's it. And that's it. Now, uh, our business was really different. We were buying the whole production and delivering the whole production to the store. So you were taking the risk the of risk the The risk of stock. inventory, absolutely. Wow. The whole inventory risk of most of the brand's inventory risk was ours, which led to develop you know, custom service, credit control, DCs in, in Europe, then a DC in Asia, then a DC in US, so quite complex organization. We grew fast and fast and fast. And fast forward 2000, and 15, there was this management buyout, and we decided there was much more scope for that business. Not only the core business was growing healthy rate, and, and designers seemed to be happy to have a full package service to them, but obviously we had the ambition to become something more. The platform to, um, to support, uh, to foster, to nurture, to foster, to champion entrepreneurial, again, creativity within the fashion industry. That was our um, setting stones mission statement. Uh, to do that, we started asking, uh, questioning ourselves, what do they need? Well, we have a lot of data, so probably we can use a bit of intelligence or smart intuition, gut and data combined together, thick data rather than big data to help them designing merchant, not designing, but merchandising the collection. So that's something they need, advice. Then... Uh, Sorry, also because mostly they were young company without all the spices. They were largely young companies uh, with energy and buzz and a yeah. unique point of view. There were a few established brands which needed to readdress their audiences okay. and uh, refocus on a new cons yeah. consumer the new the Gen Z, the millennials, uh, very obvious targets, but there were, there were and there are some established brands we're working with, but let's say our, the love of and the passion is the, the first step, you know, the, the, the start, the start. The start. Mm. So, so they needed advice, so we created a, we actually purchased a boutique com, uh, consulting company in Milano with a team of very talented people between business management and merchandising. So we, that became Tomorrow Consulting, it was the first brick added to Tomorrow showroom operation. Uh, that became an interesting proposition, and you know, fast forward, things go well, number of projects well delivered, 25 people now, and you know, an office in London, an office in New York, uh, it, it's growing healthily, and so we can advise our designers and, and, and established brands in the market for specific projects, connecting talents and connect, connecting new audiences. Then we soon realized that... Uh, that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough, because <laughs> we are an incubator, but you know what, we also are an accelerator. We're a business accelerator. So what happens to a designer or a small company when a well-controlled growth brings them to five, 10 million euros? And guess what, or pounds, uh, guess what? Oh my God, cash flow? Oh my gosh, business, business planning? Oh my gosh. Logistics. Logistics, oh my gosh, Production. product development, mm. uh, and the fabrics, uh, and the warehousing of all of that, and the atelier, and, 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 and. It, you, can, you can go down because you're not prepared for your you, success. It's right? much more dangerous to yes. be in your five to 10 million euro business than then, you are in your first million, you know? Yeah. And it's not about money because, I mean, money, 
It's a commodity, it's available out there. It's, a, it's about having money investment and how to spend them, how to leverage on the money Correct. you have in your pockets because we have plenty of unfortunate um, experiences of, of designers at that stage receiving uh, friends and family money or raising capital from wealthy individuals and then it actually doesn't work. Uh, because there's no because there's no support. Because Mentoring the money dry up very quickly. It's just money. There isn't anything else. Yeah, got it. So you go immediately to the make. I had experiences in my past, and they weren't particularly exciting experiences. I have been a licensing partner for Evizu. I have been a licensing partner for, for Ralph Simmons actually in my past uh, uh, business, and I wasn't great. I, frankly, I really wasn't great. It wasn't my job. I, I tried to to learn a job, but didn't have the right talent. To be fair, probably didn't even have the right capital to put at work back then. And well, maybe you didn't believe in that system, in that I, way of I doing it. I believed, I definitely believe in those two different ways. The, mm. You know, the premium denim when there wasn't such a thing as a yeah. premium denim, we were talking about the early 2000s, not to mention that I always believed and always will believe in the power of creativity or Ralph Simmons. I didn't believe in myself, my organization. No, exactly, that's I what I meant. I wasn't you didn't ready. believe in the way that was managed or done. Oh, no, no, I was terrible. <laughs> I, I, I sucked and I, I was in Italy. There was a lot of manufacturing knowledge, but zero marketing understanding or wow, community that's building. A big it, it, I've been talking about my own company. So uh, 10 years later, learn a lot by, uh, from mistakes. I, and, and, and money are important. We had enough retaining earnings and investment to, to put at work. So I felt comfortable to risk again. So we realized these designers need to make stuff. And making stuff is much more complicated than it sounds, and it's much more complicated than paying the bills of a factory. It's about a critical path, the creativity within a frame, mm. uh, processes, logic, merchandising, fabrics. Uh, quantities and... Quantities, stuff, yeah. minimum quantities, surcharges. Yeah. <gasps> I get scared yeah. myself, and I'm mm. supposed to be the CEO here, or not the, the, the creative in, uh, on a ta at the table. It's, 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 it's impossible to deal with. So uh, what we created is an atelier, the dream of every designer. What makes the huge difference between large houses and, uh, and small designers is their uh, huge, uh, of course, ta full of talent and resources, but also the access to the atelier. So we now have the possibility for these designers to actually create their samples, see them you know, so, so you, but actually you mean an actual I mean, place I, where people I, I mean sew actual, samples, actually, make samples? I actually do mean uh, several talented uh, uh, women and men uh, with 25 years of man. experience uh, and the ability of doing stuff and cutting, pattern cutting, etc., etc., which gives the ability to designers we invest into to, to see the prototype and to control the process of creating, not relying on a third party. So we advise them and we, for, for a limited amount of, of brands, we can make product for them and then we can produce the product for them. But I need to go a step behind because Please. I'm not sure uh, the people that are listening know about this. So you, you mentioned the word invest. So in your process, you know, when you're an incubator, an accelerator, you also give investment, so you buy stakes. Yeah, in the company you uh, want to have. Obviously, we have we have we have to limit our capacity towards uh, uh, financial ability, uh, ability. We have and the time and the scale and the attention we can put. So we are not. We have an incubator, which is the showroom business operation, where we select talents yeah. through various uh, incredible um, support and advisors we have around the world, and that's the first phase, which can be the phase, can be a showroom relationship. We have thirty or 35 designers between men's wear and women's wear and accessories, which are within our showrooms in Paris or London or New York or, or Los Angeles, and they sell a traditional business model B2B through us. Uh, when we recognize there are a number of uh, characteristics, which could be emotional intelligence of the person, unique point of view, uh, right energy. What uh, about the market response? 
Um, Less? About how they behave within the response, what they make with the response of the market. So after you incubate and you live with them very intense hours during the market and fashion weeks, and you support them when they are doing their fashion show, they are support, supporting mm. their, their, when they are in their meeting with Gallery Lafayette, for example, and you see and you recognize what's there, then there might be a chance for the business accelerator if they are interested, and the business accelerator comes with investment and comes with a, with a make. So how does that work? Then you decide, after all what you said, they are the right one, and how does that work? Then you call them and you say, hey, Sam. Hey. I call you all <laughs> hey. Sam Ross, we're going to go into that. Hey, Sam, um, can I give you some money? <laughs> well, I, I'm not an that investor. That would be the phone call that many want. Yeah, no, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily work. It comes really organically, to be honest. Okay. It's, uh, it's, um, we recognize there is a chance and talent, and we normally ask, uh, uh, what, what would you need? What would make you you know, um, happy and able to achieve your targets? What are uh, your needs, and, and what kind of business model would you see yourself in the next five years? It's important to know. Yeah, of course. It's important to know if they uh, have to have a the business brand they are designing. Business plan. Uh, it's important to know if the brand they're designing is, uh, is a, a, curate, a curated project so they can achieve a position within a big maison. Or, again, sorry, I'm repetitive, I'm kind of a broken record, if they want to create their own business. And you want that, right? I like, I mean, I, I'm happy for them either way, but for myself and for my interest in, in investing into brand, I like the latter, of course, rather than that. Than the first. So what happened? What happened? Our first ever investment into IP, uh, as, as we know, is A. Cole Wall and Samuel Ross. Um, that happened pretty organically. Uh, my business partner Giancarlo Simiri was an incredible eye for talent, especially in the menswear age. And uh, really, I thought that was is, uh, you and you alone. I, no, no, no. <laughs> not not at all. I I. I I, I love talents, and I'm one of uh, a, a large team of, of incredible talent people. Talent scouters. I'm one of which is Julie Gihart, which is one of our directors to the board, uh, who was never ending, you know, power and ideas, uh, energized the company. But in, specifically, Giancarlo has this great eye for, for many things, but these things in particular, and came to me and say, we got to do this, we got to do this, look at this. And I say, well, you, you got it right. It was so, so right. Oh, it was so right. It was so right. Not that I didn't know what Echo Wall was, but I didn't know, I didn't know the people. So you organized this dinner, and it was me, and Giancarlo, Samuel, and, and Andrew, Ace, he's, he's a business partner. It was a very good thing. Who, sorry, who's Andrew? Ace, Andrew. Andrew is the business portion of the duo, and he's uh, working with Samuel since 10 years. Ah, OK. So, uh, the four of us, we started talking, it was meant to be a quick dinner, just an introduction. It was like two hours of chatting, good energy. Um, and we decided to work together immediately. It was like a, a showroom distribution, it was a distribution agreement. So we went on the market, we asked them what they wanted to achieve. We hit the targets, we sold men's for during women's or season because there was no time to do it during menstrual season. It was a huge success, and they were happy. And so this is when, two years ago? It was three years ago? No, it was really no, recent. It was like September 2017. Yeah. So we yeah, two met ago. in June 17. We Not spoke even, through the thing. Yeah. In July, we actually had a collection in the showroom in Paris uh, in, uh, in September 17. And then a month later, a few weeks later, Samuel, you know Samuel, incredibly yes. intelligent and smart. Yeah. Very smart. Guy, uh, articulate, intelligent, and smart. I have to repeat it three times. But he's an entrepreneur as well. He's an entrepreneur, sure. absolutely. And uh, he came to us and said, why don't we do this together? Because you guys have a platform, and you probably can do more than what you're actually doing. And it was amazing. It's like, like um, developing your business strategy on demand. Wasn't it incredible? So I said, yes, we can. Of course, we can. That was a fast decision. It was a fast, it was the fastest decision of our lives. And uh, we built up a business plan together um, before talking about how to do things. We, we aligned the expectation of all parties. And it was the easiest process I've gone through in recent years. Wow. Uh, and then we put an investment into the brand. Uh, the investment wasn't based on some uh, mathematical venture capitalist private equity metrics. But what do we need to make this work? And how much do we want to get involved with this? 
and it was. So then you, uh, you was actually an, buy some stakes. We invested. We drove capital into into yeah. the brand company, and 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 in exchange in, ex in exchange of shares, of course, we are shareholders. Shares, yeah. We are yeah. proud business partners of Equal Wall. So you give uh, a little bit in hard cash and a little bit in mentoring or in platform. We did. That. We are. We are two ways to invest. Availability. Uh, the, and our investment system is very good because we give money for the brand, and then we pay for the operations on the side, which, yeah. is, uh, which is a double investment, obviously. Yeah. So uh, the investment was for a cold wall in terms of developing the design studios, yeah. the marketing, and people, doing people marketing, yeah. and it's all about creation, marketing creation, and, uh, um, and then we license the brand, so essentially, after investing, we also license the brand, so we take care of the product development, uh, the manufacturing, the uh, uh, wholesale sales, the retail sales, the experiential retail, pop-ups, uh, um, uh, e-commerce. Uh, At your expenses. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, and, uh, so you pay for everything, actually. Well, well yeah, but of course, we, 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 we hopefully, we try to get a profit out of this. I think, uh, I think of it's this, uh, Ross. And I, I have no doubt that this is a very wise investment. We made not, not only a, an extremely nice relationship. Um, it, is, it, is, uh, it is somebody so intelligent because he, he's asking us, he's driving us, and he's only 27, you know. Yeah, he's a very young. Yeah. And he has a child or two, right? He's a child, yeah. Child, yeah. He's a, he's a child. And um, uh, unsurprisingly, he's a talent with a lot of discipline. And that's probably a new, you know, younger generation of talents are incredibly committed. Uh, uh, and they know where they're going. And, and yeah, they are businessmen too. So uh, someone is encouraging me, uh, us, to do more, to be more helpful rather than less helpful. Mm. Um, we recognize uh, we serve we serve as a number of brands. Uh, we needed to centralize an experienced marketing function, for example. Uh, all brands need uh, uh, a strong platform for their e-commerce D2C sales. Uh, a recent hire, which I'm incredibly proud of, long longtime friend, and she was already a board member of Tomorrow in the Past, Alessandra Rossi, the chief digital officer. She left a position as UX president. <laughs> she now is... Uh, well done. Well, uh, well I'm, Federico Marchetti must hate you right now. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure he doesn't. She has been there for like 12 or 14 yeah. years. <laughs> it's time to move. I, I'm, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, they so will then each other she, she can now serve your she brand. Is creating, she is creating this incredible unit uh, where we can serve the brand. You can plug into a uh, e-commerce function, a B2B, a B2C, and attached to that there is the marketing and digital marketing function, mm. function. So content creation and content distribution. And do you send these services to brands you haven't invested in? Uh, that's a good idea I'm giving you. It is, it is. Uh, so it depends on capacity. Consulting, okay. tomorrow consulting sells a number of these services, so certainly social media, digital media, um, uh, services to uh, brands we haven't invested or aren't a part of the showroom. Um, so far, the e-commerce is uh, in its infancy platform is now only for the brands we invested. Okay. Which are how many? Well, there are actually there are five. But so the, Marcus Lupfer was one of the first, right? No, no, oh. no. Marcus is my uh, longest uh, business relationship. Uh, I'm, Proud of it. It's 11 years of, of yeah. business relationship. And you own shares. Of no, the... no, we don't at all. No, oh, we well, have. I a, we you have a par business partners. Well, I call him a business partner because he is my business partner and he's a friend, and he's an incredible talent, which show, shows you how incredibly different can be the fashion industry. And now you see successes and talents. I see a cold world being a success and a, ta a, a successful story and a talent, but I also see Marcus Luffer being success and, 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 and a talent. Yeah. Uh, he, he built up his own uh, very sustainable business. Talk about creative entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial creative. Oh my, Ma Marcus is a, is a successful businessman, which has an incredible um, sustainable sustainable business in terms of three hundred and sixty duration, uh, duration of the business. With a nice group of people, is a profitable business. He has been with us eleven years. Uh, 
and constantly growing his market and his audience. Uh, so and you distribute his... We are distributors and agents for him and... Uh, and uh, and he's yeah. not leaving because sometimes the problem is, well, I'm sure you're going to agree with me, but sometimes the problem is that you build a business that, and then yeah. when they're grown up, they're like, thank you very much. Now I hire someone internally so I don't pay you. They are. That, that but happens. he's not doing that, it. That, 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 well, it hasn't happened so far and I hope Marcus will stay with us forever. Um, but it happened in the past with a number of incredible yeah. talents that they, they leave Back then, to be fair, we were only a showroom and only a distribution company. So it's quite normal. It's, it's normal. What I realize, they tend to leave far too early, not understanding in full the consequences. They're not ready. Not ready. Maybe they receive a couple of million pounds in investment and they think they have money for the rest of their lives. And the truth is that without a business plan and a business model, which makes sense, mm. those money, and I just drop a number, don't get me wrong, it, they're not going to last forever and what a platform can give you, even if only a sales platform, is incredibly important for you. Um, I, I, I saw a number of designers leaving us for the wrong reasons, and I yet have to see one designer leaving us. Succeeding. I hope for a couple of them to succeed, but I can't see anything extremely better happen to them because of they left us. Mm. And I, I know it sounds like a little bit like I'm defending my own well, even old if school were, core business, but, but uh, uh, yeah, investing in brands is a way to have longevity of relationship, but it's also a way to, to put your money when your mouth is too. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know what, you're really, you're really good and we are out there saying you're really good and you know what? We take, our, we take yeah. a risk on you. And, and which doesn't mean that we won't, we have an amazing organization which does wholesale sales or retail sales and they work with a number of brands and they will work incredibly well for their successes for three, five, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, I, I, I don't even want to think, to let people think that if we don't invest, we don't believe. The truth is that we have a limited capacity and brain power for a number of, of, of investment operations. There are five today. Uh, there might be a little bit more. So you want be to, hundred. Yeah, of course. We don't have not, the scale. We yeah. don't have the capacity. And then you, you don't take care so personally anymore. But who yeah. are the five? Uh, we, well, there are. You can say. It, right? Not all the five at the moment. I okay. can. I can. Uh, if there you, must if be you, something happening. If you don't mind, if you don't mind, and I'm sorry to say no, to play. Of course. I didn't seek with that. Um, we uh, recently invested and announced in Coperni, which makes me unbelievably proud and close to emotional about this investment, which is mm. not exactly the perfect rationale for a CEO on, on, on wow. investing. But let's say we like uh, that. the story there is amazing. So I, I, it was my first time as a jury member of Andam Fashion Award. I don't have to tell you what the jury of the I've Andam... Been one you've been before one. So your time. I, I mean, I got into the room. I was the younger in the By venue. the way, that's how I became best friend with Todd Lee, and it's still today is one of my best friends. I see. I discovered Magic. him through Andam, yeah. Magic happens with the truth. But he Natalie. didn't win. I fought, but he didn't win. I, I, I was there the first time, this incredible big room, you know, C-shaped table, and you have you know, yeah, yeah. everyone there. Yeah. Monsieur Pinot, anyone I want to mention. And you feel so small, and you're there, you're looking around, and you're <laughs> You're shivering, and, and, and uh, it's hot because it's June, and there's no air conditioning because it's Paris. And anyway, uh, I, was, I was the mentor, the new mentor of, of uh, the New Talents Award, and uh, Coperni won, and down, hands down. It was amazing. It was like these two guys came, uh, came into the... Sebastian and Arnaud. Sebastian Arnaud, Arnaud. Arnaud, who are talented, committed, entrepreneurial, and absolutely adorable. But yeah, aren't they I, a little bit like <laughs> new China or husband? One is business and one is a designer, right? They're not both a designer. No, yeah. One, uh, one comes from product design, not from fashion design, and has established his, his route into fashion uh, uh, in a very successful, interesting way. The other one comes from uh, a deep understanding and knowledge of fashion. I, I believe they've been working in big Balenciaga, groups. if I'm not wrong, yeah. for, for a few years. Uh, and he is business minor, but he's very has a great sensitivity for product, yeah. too. They, they are absolutely creatives, both of them. So they won the, uh, they the won Andam, the Andam and, 
Uh, which we, is 150,000 euros, right? We, I can't remember it was back then, but it was quite a sizable check. Yeah. And uh, so they won us, I guess. So they, were, they came with the showroom. So it was the first time a French maison was in a multi-brand showroom. It was a kind of a new thing. So when you say they won us, meaning they won the They're right free, free of charge to be services free of charge. On a, free, for, for a, a year. full year, which is a pretty valuable proposition. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we had uh, this incredible guy, Marco, who still is with us as a head of, uh, of sales of the new generation of designer, taking care of them. And uh, you know what? They open up the 35, 40 top doors in the world from season one. And uh, everybody fell in love with the product. It was so chic and so nice and yeah, so I humble remember. about what we were doing. And this thing started very well on the right, uh, on the right step. Then they got. Uh, then Courage uh, came. Then Courage came, <laughs> and I, I, and I, I can't deny I wasn't happy. So, I, and I, Sebastien Arnaud knew it. I, I, I came to Paris with lunch, and I tried to talk them out of the deal, because they were creating something special with Copernic. But I also, in my heart, I understand, you know, the the, the pleasure, the interest of taking on board uh, an heritage. French Maison, and you are 25 or 26. And, and their name incredible. became known instantly because of that, right? Absolutely. They, but it didn't go well. I, I don't know. I think they did a great job in yeah. Courage. Yeah. And I have uh, uh, I'm not particularly into or particularly interested in what the big Maisons are doing in general, uh, because we're doing something completely different. Uh, uh, the story it is that they left uh, before the expired, uh, I think, before the contract was due, and they they positioned their mind as digital native into uh, absolutely interesting, amazingly interesting digital project, which I'm sure I can cannot talk about. But and they, they we met again uh, this time in my um, form of investor of angel investor. So, so you I, contacted them again? No, they actually uh, probably bump into each other somewhere, or they contacted me for a meeting about this new. Yeah. Idea, digital idea. So I spent some time with them uh, checking out this idea, which was absolutely brilliant. And I started teasing them, guys, you have to come back. You are, you are too young. I understand all these millennial things that you have to change stuff. But, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> but, but please, I mean, you were on to something special. Come over, do something. And, uh, and uh, they were doubtful. We don't want to do it. Say, so, you know what? Next week is my birthday. And I'm going to be in uh, in Italy, in the northeast of Italy, and going to have. Uh, uh, I'm going to go through the atelier. And why don't you come over? It's Your atelier is in northern. It wasn't my atelier, but but it was an atelier uh, back an then. An atelier, yeah. Uh, back then it was it was an atelier, and I said, "Come to Venice. It's the last weekend of the Venice Biennale. It's a good chance." Uh, be my guest, enjoy this weekend in Venice, and spend one day in the atelier and tell me you're not interested in doing something for yourself. So they came on That's to so this smart. trip, and uh, so it happened. It's where, a lovely bribe you gave them. <laughs> uh, yeah, it wasn't intended, but uh, yeah. but yeah, I was more, uh, I wanted to spend some time with them, to yeah. be honest. Uh, so they came over to Venice, we had this incredible, wonderful fish dinner. Uh, I'm a foodie, so. Uh, uh, it was really very good, very good, and it happened to be a lot of interesting people around the table because they, they were, there was Shane Oliver, uh, which we were doing a fantastic project together back then. It was Diesel Red Tag uh, mm. consulting project. Uh, there were the, the the guys from Sune, talented designers. They're were very working. good. They're very very, very good. good and very committed too. Uh, um, so why were they there? Else. They work with you. You distribute. Uh, we are distributors for them, and okay. they were using same facilities for their own product. It just happened to have this number of incredible talents uh, uh, around the same table. So we had a beautiful dinner, and uh, and, and they, they said came. yes. No, they didn't say yes. They 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 were very happy though. So mm -hmm. um, after a few bottles of nice white wine, uh, they went back to Venice. Yeah, goes to Prime. A week later, they called me and said, you know what, we might think about doing this. It was November 17. And uh, we started talking about. Uh, oh, November 17? It was November Even 17. Even last yeah. November? No, no, it was November wow. 17. So we, they, they, they took their time. They have, to, you know, they have to accomplish other things. They have projects. They have consulting jobs they have to mm. work with. And then we started over again with Coperni, thinking about what they wanted to do. But fast forward, we invested into the brand. Um, we, we rented a studio, so we have a studio in Paris. It's a very nice, very nice studio. They hired their 
people from their community. Um, Arnaud is running the Maison business very efficiently. And again, we licensed the brand, so we gave the investment was all for the brand and marketing and design and people, whereas all the operations are taken care mm. uh, by by Amazing. tomorrow, which, which is your garden which is, it is great. No, it's 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 a bet. They cannot afford in their in their PNL to do what we can afford on a PNL, which is brand. Afford, a, meaning uh, they afford, cannot afford. Afford, sorry, okay. yes, my English. No, no, they don't cannot, worry. I they cannot sure. afford. They cannot afford to do it in one line as a silo. What brand, you can, what you can do. Yeah. So what, this is I mean, all the basic of what we're doing. The platform, you plug and play. Yeah. There's already a large, sizable business into it, and and you. But can it's not charity because that. eventually you will have a there's return. There's value. There's obviously value in the IP. We are creating. It's, I mean, it's yeah, a startup. Course. For now, it's early to think about it, and obviously, we try not to. You know, lose money on the operations. So probably it's not possible at the beginning, but it's a it's a calculated risk in the medium terms. And uh, um, you were asking about the business models, and I think the business models of a platform is more efficient than the business model of a silo. So we started the whole thing. We announced uh, they announced actually uh, the partnership uh, on, uh, on yeah, the it was all over the press. It was yeah. all over the press. People obviously love them, and there is a reason why. That's when I called you. That's what you <laughs> called me. Thank you very much. And then uh, we launched in Paris with a beautiful presentation. Did you see the Instagram? Yeah, I did it. No? I went Organize immediately. Your life. It was I did great. my great. A bit of Black Mirror. Yeah, it was pretty. Um, it was pretty cool. I don't know so if it worked. Cool. I, work I think commercially. It, I think it worked very well. And there's a lot you can create on the contents they created yeah. there. Um, I could. I was obsessed. You, can, you know, you go to Copenhagen and Life, I, you go to Black I like the collection. I think they still have time to grow oh, absolutely. into it. But it was, I thought it was a humble, clever, discreet, yet noticeable, if it makes sense, I beginning. Th I think. And they're making clothes. A little bit what Vedmont was saying at the beginning. We make clothes that people want to wear. Absolutely. They, they have their own community. And they are digitally native, obviously. And they are Parisian. And they have so many talents. Very Parisian. Uh, very Parisian. And they are uh, uh, surrounded by talented friends. And they share services and helps yeah. and supports between the, uh, themselves. Um, what happens is that they decided to, to do clothes with a high quality, with a price point that they Friends could affordable, afford. yeah, afford. very so, clever. Um, so it's positioning the designer, designer price, but also affordable designer price, mm. and it's immensely chic, as you can see, because mm. they very chic. The, uh, we cannot deny we're using, um, you know, fa fabrics and factories who are dealing with the, the likes of bigger more, brands. And, yeah. uh, uh, so it's not cheap to make, obviously, and we are taking on it uh, on margins to make sure there's a marketing. Tool on the oh, pricing, really? of course, but that's that's part of the strategy. And yeah, that's but not many people do that. Well, you ha you have to do. I mean, you, oh, you I have agree. to do what you have to do if you want to have something which creates, which has longevity. Um, um, we have a strategy. We start with B two B because I believe in B two B. Also, we have a D two C, very smart and interesting strategy. We're going to unreal. Um, uh, in, the near, in the near future, we have incredible retail oh, business partnerships. Uh, mm. the, I mean, I, I, I don't mean to cut you, but I know we're can. short on time and I could go on. Forever, yeah. Me too, but before we leave this, I really need to give five minutes to the thing that was just announced in Paris for the Japanese designer in your new showroom, which is actually the incubator, right? The incubator, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, there are, there were, it was a, an eventful quarter for, yeah. uh, at tomorrow. Uh, two things happened. Uh, the first thing, which comes from Tomorrow Consulting, is a partnership with Jetro Japan um, to create an incubator for upcoming Japanese designers. And the first uh, experience was amazing, because yeah. I loved men. I've seen. Poggy. I mean, yeah. Poggy is not only an incredibly talented person, he's one of the nicest human beings you can Oh, is he? You, absolutely. And uh, we created the concept of um, the Poggy box, where Poggy was curating a number of upcoming designers and creating So he shop. chose them, not he your chose, he, Well, we, we, um, I, I believe Poggy and uh, actually Giancarlo did a lot of the selection together. 
and uh, they created a shopping shop concept, which is the Poggy Box, which is beautiful, Fantastic. which then will become a pop-up store, it's traveling around 20 places in the next season. In the world or in, in the Japan? World, uh, in, in the, the world, world, not only in Japan. It's actually created and curated for... Export. And those are all startups of Japanese yeah, fashion brands? Yeah, brand. mostly start startups. So the, the future uh, Yoji the fu and... Hopefully the future Yoji's, <laughs> and we can trust uh, uh, their guts. And the second thing was opening, you know, like trying to walk away from being a showroom, but yet you open another showroom. Yeah, I've seen. Uh, the truth is that is not a showroom, obviously. We, uh, we have a wonderful um, showroom building in Paris, which is a commercial showroom, showroom, which is highly curated and we're really proud of. And it's a business uh, incubator, uh, accelerator, pardon. And we have this incubator, which is Tomorrow Le Palais, which is this incredible hotel, particularly in the fifth, where we curated experiences. Um, performances, uh, installations, uh, uh, only one mannequin, uh, meet the designer, a different concept of short. What's only one mannequin? I mean, for example, we had uh, uh, one of our new uh, favorite uh, brands, Colville, which wasn't actually selling the collection, it was, it was a pre-collection sales, and it was installing the shopping shop concept through mannequins there. So it's not oh. a place only to sell. It's a place to meet people, it's, uh, but is it open to customers or only to business? It is, it for now, it's only open to press wow. and fashion. Uh, but yeah, you actually very, very rightly. So there's, there is an idea to have a more open approach to fashion and to let people, real people, see. But we did something different from from the usual uh, fashion weeks. We open up uh, for a cocktail and we invited a few friends. A few friends happened to be 300 people, which was overwhelmingly surprising, especially because it was a Saturday. Uh, traffic is terrible, a lot of competing uh, events, events that night. In Paris, yeah. We didn't expect it, but it was very exciting. Overwhelming. And it was overwhelming. People coming there, hanging out there for two, three hours, meeting the designers, chatting. It's a beautiful uh, venue also in the left bank, a, right? It's an incredible. Yeah. I, I can't lie to you, it's an incredible venue. It's, yeah, it's, that, it's a free, matters. it's a free, large floors, five floors in total. <laughs> Hotel particular is like a castle, it's with an incredible garden. You're doing well tomorrow. Uh, the, the, comp the company has, um, we, we're not you know, a digital disruptive company, <laughs> we are a platform for yeah. businesses, so we, we are run as a, as, as, a, as a company which needs to generate profits, and we have been, uh, both receiving investments and retaining earnings in the past few years. Uh, we're growing, it's getting more difficult, and maybe we're gonna do a lot of things in the wrong way, very likely. <laughs> but probably some of them will be done well, for yeah, lack of a for good, sure. and uh, we hope we can be here for quite some time. And, and again, I don't like to change the topics, but I have to, because you're so generous in your answers. Um, just before we leave, what about sustainability in the sense not of the long-term business, but in the you know ethics or uh, environmental sense? I mean, does it matter if in your choices? Do you believe that if fashion doesn't go in that direction, it will? Well, let, let's start by saying that uh, I mentioned her before. Julie Gearhart is uh, yeah. on our board, and Julie is not only an incredible talent. Uh, is absolutely one of the experts of, of sustainability within the fashion industry contest. Uh, we know exactly what our industry does for, in terms of pollution, the second largest industry in terms of pollution after the energy, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and we <laughs> honestly think that there isn't the need of too much stuff out there, producing stuff, to sell stuff, to produce stuff, to get people buying stuff, to throw them away and buy other stuff. Mm. Um, I do believe that what we do which is helping young talents to reach an audience, which is a reasonably limited audience, is the right thing, because people should buy more of unique pieces and hang on them for months Longer and years, time. rather than, you know, swallowing stuff constantly. So the business model is sustainable per se, in terms is we are not overwhelmingly distributing product, and we don't think we should, we don't define mm. success within the size of the business but within the quality. Then there are, um, in practice, how you learn day by day how to be lesser impactful. Because obviously, there's nothing more sustainable than no business, but it comes with no taxes and unemployment. So we need to have a sustainable business, and that has to be 
uh, made in the most possible sustainable way. Within the resources that we have, we cannot kill the company mm. from day one because we change all the processes. But the atelier is in Italy. The workshops are around Italy and they are 20 minutes away. And the people we employ there, uh, they are actually using um, uh, um, uh, hydrogen fuel cars to go around, which is nothing because there are free cars, they're not 1500 cars, but at least they're not yeah, using they're a not diesel car. Yeah. And, uh, and our showrooms uh, and our offices uh, are, are abandoning plastic, and uh, uh, everything you see around is recyclable or bio biodegradable. Yeah. Sorry, but do you ask that to, to the Sam Ross? Do you ask that to the brands you invest in? Do you ask them to be oh, conscious, or maybe they I, are because I they don't young. need to ask anything yeah, exactly. because I, I mean, I mean, uh, Summer Ross teaches me what means to recycle, reuse, upcycle, and and what is community of of consumers and uh, audience uh, wants. So I really don't. I don't know if we come together for a reason, and it's automatic. But I don't have to ask anyone. And yet you realize that now there are ten brands out of. Uh, of 30 within the contest of tomorrow, which are uh, seriously engaging in the upcycling. Mm. It's, it's, we mentioned electricity before. In the building, there is electricity. In the business process, needs to be sustain, uh, sustainable practices. And you know, it's just learning piece by piece. It's happening organically. I'm, I'm, uh, is uh, it I in the world? I mean, in tomorrow? Within the contest, I know for sure. Okay. And I, and I believe it is happening everywhere. That's good. And of course, there will be greenwash, and we all like to use the word for sustainable because it was, would be fairly un unacceptable not to do so. Mm. But if you do bit by bit, at some point, you are a much more sustainable business. I'm, I'm no expert. I'm just learning, and I have good advisors, and I'm just listening. And if some, there is something we can't do... We won't. We won't. Yeah, listening is a yeah. very good start, I think. And, and yeah. But it, yeah, I, I think it's natural. Well, it's been a dream talking to you. Oh my God, and, uh, dream being here. Yeah, it's, I mean, I could go on and on. It's very interesting, but unfortunately, this is it. So thank you so much. Thank and you, I Mima. wish you and your young designers a lot of success. Thank you, Mima. Bye-bye. <laughs>